My name is Alexis Balke, and I'm a program associate here at Children and Family Futures based out of the Irvine, California office. I would like to acknowledge that we did receive many questions from all of you during the registration process. We tried to incorporate these questions into our presentation. Now, I would like to introduce you to Teresa Lemus, Program Associate from Children and Family Futures, for some opening remarks. Good morning and good afternoon. As Alexis said, I work for Children and Family Futures across multiple programs. I've had the pleasure of working with many of you. I've looked at the roster to see who's attending this morning, so a welcome to you as well. Um, my background is in nursing, um, specifically mental health nursing, um, detoxification and treatment services. I also have background in program administration and have worked extensively with family drug courts across the country for the past 15 years. I know that today we're going to be offering a lot of information. I hope that you are able to take it in, enjoy the webinar, and we look forward to hearing your questions at the end of the presentation. All right, we've got a couple of presenters today that I will be introducing in just a few moments. Um, we have a map here just to kind of show you who your presenters are and where they're sitting as we go through this webinar today. I'm Teresa Lemus, that's me. Um, I am stationed in Reno, Nevada. We have Pamela Baston, who will be speaking next, and she is in Columbus, North Carolina. And then we have Judge Nicolette Pock, who is in Queens County, New York. Those of you who have been on our webinars in the past, this looks probably very familiar to you. But we wanted to get started with this slide to let you know that we've had many webinars through our Learning Academy um, since 2010. In 2010, we were funded by OJJDP to start the Family Drug Court Learning Academy. Um, and that Learning Academy consists of three different stages of learning, or three different learning communities, as we like to say. We have the planning community. And if you look down underneath planning community on the slide, you've got all the different um, topics that we covered in the planning community in the green. We have the early implementation community, which talks about um, services to children, trauma-informed services, as you can see in the um, orange boxes, and follow that down. And right now, we're working on the enhanced community. So this just gives you a picture of all of the different opportunities that you have to participate in any of these webinars. And we'll be talking later about how you can access any of the webinars that you may have missed or would like to view again um, at the end of today's presentation. All right, the Learning Academy that we're involved with right now, as I said, is the advanced practice. Um, there's eight different webinars, and right now we're on effective drug treatment. But as you can see, there's been some other great webinars that we have um, presented. And we've had um, folks from all over the country, um, judges, attorneys, um, treatment providers, you know, many people who work in the field. Um, some of you may be, even be on the call today um, who have presented during these learning academies. So our next one, which we'll talk about um, briefly at the very end of today, is um, FDC models. And so this just gives you a picture, again, of what you can go back and participate in if you'd like to review a webinar or um, share that with any of your um, peers. All right, I'm going to talk briefly about why does effective drug treatment matter when you are working with an FDC. Um, most of you could probably present on this yourself, but we wanted to just provide a context for our next two speakers. Um, when we look at the way that um, FDCs have been impacted by the economy, um, by the fact that we have um, a lot of folks asking a lot of questions you know, in Congress and in our own states and jurisdictions about you know, why do we fund this type of program, um, one of the things we want to look at is, are family drug courts effective? Are we able to tell that story and answer the questions to those who are holding us accountable. In order to be able to answer those types of questions and to talk about long-term sustainability, the FDC team has to ensure that there's a solid, trusting relationship with one of the main or one of the main partners in your family drug court, which is the treatment provider. Um, let's face it, without having substance abuse and other types of mental health and other types of treatment involved with the family drug court, 
it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for the Family Drug Court to be effective. And so we want to talk today about um, some different tools, some different strategies for engaging the treatment provider, um, but also in looking at it, do we have the best types of treatment being offered to our families and is this so when we talk today about um, effective treatment, one of the things that we want to um, get across is that there's many different ways that treatment is funded in this country. And it's important that as a part of the FDC team that you have some understanding um, about how treatment is funded in your community. So that's something you could talk to the treatment provider about if you have um, hopefully a relationship with the director of your treatment program or with your state, um, it would be a, a good thing for you to look at how are things funded um, and how can we ensure that our clients who go through the Family Drug Court um, have some priority and or are able to have immediate access to treatment when it's identified that treatment is actually something that they need. So we're not going to go into each one of these, but just to recognize that in some cases, treatment services, which by the way, are primarily funded in this country through um, you know, different grant programs such as the um, Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. Um, some of you who work with um, programs who bill insurances and things like that know that the primary source of income for the clients that we serve tends to be um, that tends to be the, the, the block grant and tends to be um, public dollars that are going towards treatment. So you have regional types of funding. Um, again, many, of, many times that's coming from the federal government. Um, you also have different people who are making, helping make the choice about who are they going to fund as far as treatment goes in their region or in their state. And so these, are, again, are questions that you want to go back and ask so that you know that you have a provider who has the resources to be able to provide the services and to provide immediate access to your family. Another resource that we're going to refer to quite a bit today, um, and this is a, a resource that's free and you can actually download it, um, and you see the web address on the slide, is a document that was put out you know, quite a long time ago. It's been over 10 years that the National Institute on Drug Abuse put out the principles of the drug addiction treatment. And as, it, as you can see on the document, it's a research-based guide that goes through um, different principles, 13 of them that says, you know, when you look at treatment or you're looking at your treatment provider, these are questions you need to be asking or these are things that need to be incorporated into those treatment services in order for it to be effective. And so, again, we're going to refer back to this quite a bit today. We wanted you to know that it's a resource that you can download or ask for a copy of so that as you look at treatment resources in your community, you have something to use in, to ask some questions about the treatment provider and the services that they're providing. One of the things that you'll see in the 13 um, different principles is that um, we're not in this alone. So I think it was Hillary Clinton back probably about 10 years ago who said it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and I would say the same thing when you're talking about effective um, treatment and effective family drug court services is that it really takes a multitude of partners um, for family drug courts to be effective. And so when we talk today about treatment, please know that we are not excluding mental health services. We're not excluding things like um, medication management. We know that if you look at this graphic on the page, you've got things all the way from child care to um, medical services, um, legal services, everything that your families are going to need to tap into um, in order for them to be effective, to go back and um, meet the, the guidelines that we have, meet all of the criteria for family drug courts, um, to attend to their case plans, work through their treatment plans, all of those different things that we're asking them, they're going to need the help of all of these different providers. And so um, just the point being, we're not in this alone, and we need to really make sure that we have all of the partners at the table. 
So how is ensuring effective treatment a collaborative practice issue? Well, you're going to be hearing today from Pam Baston. She's going to give you an overview of what is considered um, you know, principles or guidance around effective treatment. She's also going to be talking about the science of addiction um, and talking about the different roles and um, things that you as the judge, as the attorneys, one of the attorneys as the treatment provider, as the child welfare worker, all of those different roles that we have in family drug courts, each one of you plays a different part, but all of you come together as a slide depicts um, to make sure that you have an effective practice. And so part of that is that each one of you comes to the table knowing here's my roles and responsibilities, here's what I need to do to make this work, but at the same time, we need to help one another and hold each other accountable. So we're going to be talking about that today um, and talking a lot, or referring back a lot to um, collaborative practice, helping each other make the family drug court effective. Um, I wanted to just point out on this next slide that when we talk about coming together for collaborative practice, hopefully in, within each of your family drug courts, you have um, sort of a, a, um, a system in place, a structure in place so that you have folks who not only are working right at the team level, and that's over on the right-hand side with, where it says case level, you have your family drug court treatment team. Um, that usually includes frontline staff, you know, your counselors that come to staffing. Um, but then if you move all the way over here to systems level where the green and blue slides are, you'll see that there's, you know, other levels of um, collaboration that need to be in place for a, a drug court to be effective. Um, those include things like an oversight committee where you have the director of the treatment program or the director of child welfare who is who are meeting together um, that there is a frontline counselor who's showing up to staffing every week that they have the support of their agency. Um, if you look at the blue slides for the steering committee and everyone, you know, there's different names for each of these different committees, but you want to look at, um, you know, who's that sort of middle um, management level where they're actually ensuring that um, things are happening that their staff has um, adequate time and adequate resources to, to staff the family drug court. Um, so we wanted to point this out to say um, when we talk today about collaboration, we're talking about all three levels. We're talking about you know, where buy-in needs to happen at the oversight director level, at the steering committee level, and also at the very, um, you know, right there at the, at the edge of, you know, where you meet the client at the staff, frontline staff level. This last slide before I turn it over is um, just a recap of why ensuring treatment, ensuring treatment is effective, why is that such an important issue. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to let you know that my background is in treatment. And um, I know that we have some treatment providers um, on this webinar today, which we're thrilled with. We want to ensure that um, as we present this information today that we um, respect the fact that we have, in, in a lot of the family drug courts that we see across the country, we have some extremely um, excellent treatment providers. Um, the, the webinar and sort of the reason behind the webinar is not to pick on the treatment providers, but really to help um, the entire team understand treatment from a different perspective so that they have um, a, an improved level of trust, an improved um, level of knowledge about, you know, why do treatment providers do what they do. Um, so that really is the, the emphasis of the um, webinar today, and we hope that we um, get that point across to all of you, and we hope that this is helpful as you work with your treatment providers. All right, well, I have the pleasure of introducing Pamela Baston. Pam works for Children and Family Futures. She also has other roles that um, she might may be referring to today, but what I'd like to say about Pam is that she um, wears many different hats. 
but I think that as you listen to her this morning and this afternoon, you'll appreciate the passion that she has for um, improving treatment and prevention services. Um, she has a long history in working in the field of prevention and treatment, um, and she does both work for um, Children and Family Futures, but also for SAMHSA and the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. So I would like to turn it over to Pam, who's going to talk about key components of effective and quality substance abuse treatment. Pam? Thanks, Teresa. So y'all play an important role in ensuring that parents have access to, remain in, and successfully complete substance abuse treatment. <clears throat> this part of the webinar will focus on key components of effective and quality substance abuse treatment. So for some of you, a few of the slides that we go through may reinforce what you already know, uh, while the balance of you uh, may find that these slides represent less familiar information. So regardless of which category you fall in, we appreciate your willingness to review this important information with us today. So we'll begin with um, a um, definition of um, addiction, and as you know, there are several um, definitions, and if you could advance the slides, Russ. <clears throat> the first definition is um, that addiction affects brain function and behavior. Um, so addiction is complex, but it's a treatable disease that affects brain function and behavior. Drugs of abuse alter the brain structure and function, resulting in changes that persist long after drug use has ceased. Um, so this may explain why drug users are at risk for relapse even after long periods of abstinence. And it also may explain by why many of you may observe very challenging behaviors um, of your FDC clients. Uh, and you may think, you know, well, geez, they've, they've not been using drugs. They've been drug-free for so many weeks or months. Uh, they're in early recovery. You know, we should see very observable changes in their behavior. Uh, and, and that will happen, but it won't happen initially. And as we go through um, some uh, additional information, you'll see why. Uh, but, but it's important that we understand that because of the profound effect on the brain, that you will not see um, change in their behavior right away just because the substance may be uh, gone from their system. So um, as I mentioned, there are several definitions of addiction, but this is one of my favorite ones because it goes through um, all the various um, elements of addiction that, that we often um, don't realize or, or that we may forget. Um, and in the 33 years that I've been in the field, I think this is the, the one that conveys these core concepts the best. So I'll read the definition first, and then I want to go back and highlight some of these areas that uh, I've underlined. Uh, so a core concept that has been evolving with scientific advances over the past decade is that drug addiction is a brain disease that develops over time as a result of the initially voluntary behavior of using drugs. The consequence is virtually uncontrollable compulsive drug craving, seeking and use that interferes with, if not destroys, an individual's functioning in the family and in society. This medical condition demands formal treatment. So going back over some of these underlying uh, features of this definition, um, the first is, of course, that it is a brain disease, and that's based on the structural changes that we'll talk about in a few minutes that actually occur in the brain after prolonged drug use. Uh, also that it develops over time, uh, and this is something that I think we all know and sometimes forget in practice, you know, that somebody may have used drugs for a problem that develops over time, we can't expect that problem to disappear quickly after a 30-day treatment regimen or even after a few months of treatment. You know, if it took decades to get this person in the condition that they're in, you know, we have to be patient but look for observable markers of progress, but it, but it will take time. Um, also, the fact that um, it is initially voluntary. And so with the exception of, let's say, instances in which um, there's coercion, because um, sometimes you may have a family member that um, pr provides the drugs, encourages drug use, or in some cases even forces drug use 
on other members of the family. This happens often with children where a parent may want their child to be more compliant or be more quiet or not out while they're off doing, you know, off, when the parent's off drinking and drugging. And so often we're not aware that the introduction to drug use may often have been coerced uh, for, for young family members or even siblings. And then, of course, with teens and young women or, or women of any age, we often have a paramour who is coercing the use of drugs, uh, requiring them to do so, threatening them um, if they think they're too good to use or they refuse to use. And also, we have something uh, that happens where uh, you may have people that have a traumatic experience in their life, often related to substance uh, or physical abuse, sexual abuse, um, or emotional abuse. And as a result of the trauma that they have experienced, they may be using drugs to self-medicate. Um, so, so yes, while it may be somewhat voluntary, it's really more complex than that in many cases. And I think it serves us well to to keep that in mind that there that this is very a very complex um, process, and we'll talk about that a little later. Just how compulsive the drug use is, even to the point that you may see families that have refrigerators with no food, but the parents are spending money to, you know, shoot up or to to use drugs um, in in the absence of food for their family. Um, the compulsion is so. Um, significant. It, it's as if it hijacks that person's um, reasonable uh, thinking process, uh, and, and that's exactly what happens. And so it dominates their every waking moment, um, and it has taken the place of the things that they used to enjoy. Uh, and you'll begin to see the disruptions in family life and work and, and many other aspects of their life, but, but it is virtually uncontrollable um, at the point of addiction. Um, and that, of course, this use interferes with, if not destroys, the individuals functioning in the family, which is why it is so important that we get treatment right um, and that we, we do everything we can and make the most reasonable efforts to make sure that we have not set that individual up to fail, but in fact have connected them with the most effective treatment that we have available. And we'll talk a little more about that as well in a few minutes. Um, so lastly, that this condition demands formal treatment. That is not to be confused with, you know, getting detox and heading to an AA or an NA meeting. Um, not to be confused with, you know, pairing drug testing with a drug education course. Um, it is formal treatment. And uh, again, we'll talk about what are the components of formal treatment in a few minutes. But, but that's basically the definition. In the next slide, um, we'll see the spectrum of substance use disorders. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this slide. First, just to orient you to the slide, if you haven't seen it before, you'll see that it represents a continuum, beginning with experiment and, uh, and use of drugs, then progressing to abuse, and then progressing to dependence. You'll notice that these little blue bars um, that are either up or down represent either positive experiences or negative uh, adverse experiences. So um, you'll see that in the experiment and use phase, you know, generally things can still go well. You don't see um, adverse effects typically until the person begins to move into the abuse phase when you'll, they'll have both positive and negative experiences typically going on in their life. And then, of course, when they progress to dependence, um, basically, all or most all of the uh, experiences that they have in multiple domains of their life um, are, are negative. Um, so to, to go through these with a little more detail, um, again, with the exception of pr um, coercion um, and with the exception of, of prenatal exposure, uh, most use begins with a person experimenting. Um, they, in, in much like maybe some of y'all have done with alcohol when you were growing up or even other substances where it, it is something of interest to you. You might have some pressure, peers, paramours, and such, but it's something that, that is often voluntary, at least to begin with. Um, and even if it, if it produces the expected results that you were hoping for, um, most people leave this phase uh, after a, a short period of time, you know, even if they get good results, they may determine that the squeeze wasn't worth the juice. They don't want to take the risk of losing a job or getting a DUI or getting 
um, arrested for drug use, and so they stop their use in that um, phase. But, um, and, and you'll notice typically you're not going to have child maltreatment related to experimental use, uh, experiment and use. Um, you don't have very many adverse effects when you're in these early phases. So then for a small percentage, and these are obviously the ones likely to be in your um, drug court and related programs, you'll get, um, the, the, the folks will get either a physiological reinforcement from the alcohol or drugs based on a genetic predisposition. And by that I mean if the, the individual came from a family that has a history of um, substance use and dependence, they may have a genetic predisposition in such a way that when they use a substance, they get a completely different physiological reaction, very reinforcing for them, whereas somebody who might be sitting next to them using the same drug may not have that same reaction because they may not have had that genetic predisposition. So you've got the, the genetic component here that may reinforce the use. Um, and then also um, what happens in this phase, people generally have rules about their use. So they may say, you know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smoke pot, but I'm not going to take anything more serious. I'm not going to try cocaine or try other drugs. Um, and I'm going to maybe just use on weekends, but I'm not going to use before or during work or school. Um, and so they have these rules. And then over time, they begin breaking the, the rules that they've made with themselves. You know, oh, well, maybe my boss isn't even going to be here today, or I have an easy assignment, easy scope of work today, so I, I might just get high before I go to work or school or what have you. And they begin breaking their own rules about their use. Um, at this juncture, you'll see that um, th some negative um, consequences will begin to crop up in their life with work, with relationships. They might have legal issues, um, and they may begin experiencing um, substance-related child maltreatment um, in their homes uh, based on this level of drug use. And then, of course, it progresses into dependency, uh, which is characterized by significant impairment. Um, most typically uh, characterized by developing tolerance, that they have to use more of the drug to get the same effect. Um, and also they may ha develop an obsession uh, about their, their whole day is taken up with finding the drugs that they're going to use next and taking the drugs, thinking about the drugs. So you begin to see that very compulsive, obsessive behavior around their drug use. Uh, and then for some drugs, uh, they may even have um, experienced signs of withdrawal if they attempt to stop. Um, and at this point, daily functioning is very adversely affected and often in very observable ways, observable ways and um, treatment it becomes necessary. The length of time that it takes for a person to go from experiment, uh, experimental use down to dependence varies um, very much by the, the individual their environment, you know, their biology, and the drugs themselves. So um, it's very different. Um, just to give you an example, um, it, it may take years and years for a person to develop this type of dependence on alcohol for some people, where somebody could, with methamphetamine, progress this far down the continuum in a matter of months. Um, so so the, the time that it takes is very much dependent on the substance and the individual characteristics and circumstances. Um, so it, it's very important at this phase um, for there to be a, um, an assessment of the individual because you won't know, let's say from a drug test standpoint, um, whether or not that person is uh, in one phase of addiction or another. Um, the drug test will only tell you that they have a particular um, array of chemicals or certain drugs in their system at a certain level at a certain point in time. It doesn't tell you anything about their ability to parent safely, um, about the other um, strengths that they may bring or the other challenges that they may have, um, and what their needs are related to treatment. So um, it's important that you have um, professionals that have the ability to discern through an assessment process and observation and collateral contacts and urine and other drug testing methods 
um, to put all of that together and get a picture of where the person is on this continuum. I, I wish I had the technology to bring each of these little explosions, as you will, you know, uh, into the, the frame of this slide so that you could get the sense of just how overwhelming all of these issues are when a person has them layered on top of each other. Um, but this looks at some of the more typical problems that a person will come in uh, with in addition to the, the uh, alcohol and drug use um, problems that they have. They typically will also have co-occurring mental health conditions. They may have learning disabilities. They have literacy challenges, criminal justice involvement, um, tra tra trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder. They may be unemployed. They may have low skills. Um, be underemployed, they may have parenting challenges, they're likely to be poor, um, to have also no safe and stable housing. So when you think of a person coming to you with the addiction, even though intellectually we all know that they have other co-occurring problems, I think it's important for us to stop and, and remember just how many problems the typical person in our um, family dependency courts will have that uh, you're likely to see. And these issues all need to be addressed as a part and parcel of treatment. Um, and it's the compounding um, effects of all of these problems. Uh, and, and I think if you were to be honest with yourselves and look at all these problems and say, you know, how would somebody feel that has all of this going on? Um, you know, they, they have very limited um, support systems. They usually don't have resources. They may not have transportation. They don't have good jobs or, uh, you know, livable wages. They may not live in safe and stable housing. Um, and yet we then have all these expectations that we put on them, and especially in early recovery, that for a functioning healthy person with, you know, with a big support system and, a, you know, resources and, and transportation and safe place to live and lots of other kinds of strengths, you know, might find difficult. Um, and so, and I think about when I worked in public housing in a drug treatment program, I, I can't tell you how many times the clients would say, you know, sometimes when I didn't go to my treatment, it wasn't because I didn't want to, it's because I have to pass so many active drug deals. One woman told me she had to pass 17 active drug deals on the way to her bus that then she would take two or three of in order to get to a treatment program. And so I, I think it helps us to have the right context here of just how overwhelming these layers and layers of problems are. And uh, I would encourage you as, as just a, a, a tip to maybe pull a couple of your FDC case records randomly. Just look through them and start listing, you know, in the same kind of format, all the different kinds of problems that a typical uh, individual will have, a typical parent would have coming in um, to your program. And um, so that, that you have an appreciation for why the treatment that we'll talk about in a few minutes needs to be the way that it is so that it can be comprehensive and effective and address all of these things. And, um, and Judge Pock, a little bit later in our discussion today, will cover that as well. Okay, next we're going to look at, um, uh, it's a very simple slide um, of a brain that it's just a graphic, um, if we can have the next slide, a graphic depiction of how um, drug use literally rewires the brain. Um, and so um, those of you who, um, who have, uh, you know, if you think about these families or these parents that come in, they at least have temporary impairment uh, in their brain from their drug use. And so this rewiring concept that kind of happens with their drug use um, does affect the way that they behave. And, and they may behave in ways that surprise you. Uh, and you may wonder, you know, why are they not showing up for their appointments? Or why are they late? Or why are they having difficulty um, being at all of the different um, appointments that we give them, which often may be conflicting and even at the same time. Uh, and it's just important to remember that their brains have been essentially rewired and hijacked by the drugs uh, and that it will take some time for that to straighten out. Um, in the next slide, 
Uh, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as, uh, as possible. I'm not a doctor or a scientist and uh, did not even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So I'm going to try to make this very simple. But if you think about um, a pleasant experience, and if I had more time with you, I would even have you do this as an exercise, like a romantic evening, a relaxing vacation, um, playing with your child, something that you would find really pleasant. And some of us can even hear music or, or see visual um, presentations in a, in a slide or in a movie, and you immediately are, are transported into this sort of pleasant experience. And what's happening when you are transported into that pleasurable feeling is that a major brain chemical called dopamine um, is secreted into the amygdala region of your brain. And it causes that pleasure part of your brain to fire. And so you then get that pleasurable sensation. Well, addictive drugs do this only causes a, a surge of these dopamine chemicals on a regular basis. The brain realizes that someone else is producing dopamine artificially, and it doesn't need to, to do that any longer. So it either loses its natural ability to produce the dopamine for pleasure, um, or it actually can can close off and um, and and not provide that um, to the brain. So that essentially, if we go to the next slide, um, you'll see that basically um, the that the effects of that would be um, think about let's say a, a parent who comes in who has stopped using, and you're maybe doing a um, a, an interview uh, to with that parent and their children to see if they're ready to resume um, their their parenting um, interactions with their child. Maybe you're in an ob observation mode, uh, and you see the the parent, and maybe they even haven't seen their child in a while. And so you would put your values on that uh, equation and say, you know, wow, if I hadn't seen my child in a while, I would just scoop them up, and I would be so in tune with them, and I would be so connected, and I would, you know, just be very um, close with them and and so you have this sense of what it's going to look like and then you may be surprised that a parent instead seems very detached they don't seem like they're connecting on the level that you would want to see or that you would expect to see and so you know it, every situation is different and every situation is individualized but uh, it, it it could very likely be a result of the fact that their dopamine production has not resumed and they have stopped using drugs. So they're not getting that artificial dopamine production. And so, uh, you know, the, the point of this being that, that there's a lot of complexities behind the scenes, so to speak, that are operating with these um, parents that we need to take into consideration. Uh, and, and you think about the implications if we don't think about these things that, you know, how might this affect a parent's ability to, to keep their um, child, um, you know, uh, custody of their child and so forth. So we need to balance compassion and understanding and patience um, as we, we work with parents through their um, recovery process and, and while they resume these brain functions. This slide that's up now is a, a very graphic example. This happens to be for methamphetamine, but it shows in the very first um, PET scan slide uh, on the left is the um, healthy a brain of a healthy person. And then you'll see in the middle, after one month of abstinence, some of the capacity has not returned to that person's brain. But after 14 months of abstinence, you can see how similar, not quite the same, but how similar the uh, first, um, the, the, a healthy brain and a recovering brain after 14 months of abstinence can, can be. So that's just kind of making the point that, that it does take time. Um, and every person and every drug is different in terms of how long it takes. So some of the questions that you might have um, that, that would be important to ask is, you know, how long have your typical parents been using? If, again, if it's been weeks or months versus decades, um, you would want to take that into consideration. At what age did they begin using? And more than likely, the, the average age was in adolescence because that's the, the average age uh, nationally. And so if you think about it, if they, if they began using for the first time in their adolescence, they may never, and, and that's when their brain is undergoing rapid development, 
then they may never have developed the important life skills, like how to communicate appropriately, how to make important decisions, um, how to develop coping strategies to use when t times get tough. So these are the things that we all learn by trial and error, usually through a turbulent period of adolescence. But in, in the cases of, of individuals who begin using especially heavily during these years, they may never have uh, developed these mechanisms. That's why I often say that for parents or individuals like these, we are not providing rehabilitation. We're providing habilitation because we, we should not assume that they even have a level playing field or a strong foundation on which to build the kinds of things that we want them to um, to have the skills we want them to have. So um, it just makes the point that substance use disorders or drug use is just is not just one more thing. It's connected to a, a much larger picture. So now I want to turn our attention to a concept that you may be familiar with of reasonable efforts, but this time we're, we're sort of recasting that, that concept to reasonable clinical efforts. Uh, as you know, family courts have, have to meet the federal finding that reasonable efforts were made to prevent or eliminate the need for removal of children from their parents. And so if we take that concept in clinical care, you know, what we need to make sure that we are providing reasonable clinical uh, care to these parents, giving them reasonable efforts to get the help they need. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So um, drug treatment needs to be readily available. And this is one of the NIDA principles, and Teresa showed you that uh, booklet that I would encourage you to read if you haven't, and it has been updated. Um, and um, by readily available, it, we, we need it to be immediate, if at all possible. Um, they, drug users may be uncertain about entering treatment. They may be very concerned about uh, and afraid of what might happen. Um, and th but they, they have momentum going, and if you think about um, especially if their ability to parent their kids are hanging in the balance. Um, even if they haven't lost custody, they know that that's something that could happen. And so they, they will never be more motivated than they are right at that moment. And so there's a real window of opportunity. And, and really, realistically, it's more like a peephole of opportunity to connect a parent to treatment in the best maximum opportunity for their motivation. Um, and with every day that it takes us to connect someone to treatment or to that assessment that's the first step to treatment, um, it's diminishing returns. Every day that goes by, there's a, a lesser and lesser chance that they will um, be able to connect to treatment. Uh, and one of the first things that they're likely to do when they're not able to connect to treatment is go off and, and, and use drugs again. And it's not because they, um, they don't know any better, it is because that is all they know to do. Remember, they may have lost all those coping strategies or never learned coping strategies, and they have so many other things going on. Um, and also, there are certain treatment medications, and we're not going to get into those today, but there are treatment medications that help reduce some of their um, associated symptoms of depression, some mood disorders, anxiety, even some of the compulsiveness to use drugs. And so, you know, the sooner they can get a good comprehensive assessment and get uh, on their way to treatment, the earlier that person will have the benefit of having stability during that process if, if they need additional assistance through medications to, to achieve that important stable position that will enable them to be effective in, in treatment. Um, so for all of these reasons, it's important that you have um, folks that know how to conduct assessments that are very well qualified, very experienced staff, um, that they know how to do motivational interviewing, and that it's not just that they've attended a training here or there, but that they literally have ongoing supervision in their um, demonstration of efficacy in motivational interviewing. Um, if you don't have your best and brightest, most seasoned professionals in these roles, then you take the risk that you're going to have too many false negatives, you know, that being parents that needed treatment that, that were assessed as not, um, or, or the other way around, or that they will assess the wrong level of care. Uh, and so that, again, is not reasonable, you know, to have somebody who, a, a parent who has all these things going on, all these complex conditions, and somebody says, oh, you know, 
pop into an outpatient program for an hour a week and get this tune-up or take drug ed in a, a drug ed class and some drug screening and you know you'll get back on the road to recovery here so you really need someone who can tease that out and um, I know some of you are lucky enough to have that component um, within your um, drug court which makes it very um, um, much likely that it will happen faster and be more immediate and so you're already kind of on your way um, so the next slide um, is talking about assessment to treatment and so here are some key questions if you don't offer assessment within your court structure um, how accessible is the assessment uh, process that you're asking them to go to um, do they have transportation to that um, through either bus tokens or passes or someone that's going to take them or somebody in your shop who's going to take them, maybe even a recovery support specialist. Um, is the assessment process managed? And by that I mean some states have managed care and every step of the way there has to be sort of pre-approval and, and sometimes that's a lengthy process. Um, I would ha say that some systems are designed to, to be lengthy and um, it's unfortunate, but um, sometimes there's even pre-assessment -pre processes that have to happen. So in, in one state in which I've worked, they had to get a, a pre-treatment assessment, which could take anywhere up to two to three weeks, um, especially if they're in a rural area, just to tell them what they already knew, which is they needed treatment. Then they stand in line waiting another two to three weeks for an actual assessment. And so the clock is ticking by. And, and if they've lost custody of their kids temporarily, the ASPA clock, uh, the ASPA timetable kicks in. And so there, there's, uh, it, it causes all kinds of problems for that, and, and again, is not reasonable. Um, and then um, what is the wait period for the assessment and is that timely? Um, many states have gone to a 72 hour or less um, time frame. Some have immediate assessment um, and um, uh, on demand or not even requiring appointments, just walk in. Um, other questions you want to ask are what are the qualifications of the assessors? Um, do they have skills to be very engaging? Um, if you've never tried to um, access your own assessment process, you may want to do a walkthrough or pretend to be a client and call and find out what your clients go through. You would probably be astonished to learn sometimes the, the false information, the barriers, the attitudes sometimes that come across on the telephone. Uh, and remember, these clients don't need any anything that would be another barrier. They've already experienced enough in their lives for that. And they, they don't need any reason, any more excuses to be handed to them of why you know, they don't need to do this. Um, you need to think about who's going to pay for the assessment and also what's the linkage process. You know, is there recovery support or case management or other uh, means? Um, I, I just was in, um, uh, on a site visit recently and asked a, a treatment provider were they having any difficulty with uh, transportation of their clients, which were women, and uh, they said no. And then I interviewed the clients and they indicated that they, uh, no, they didn't have problems because they were hitchhiking um, and in some cases walking with kids in tow three miles or more. So, um, you know, sometimes asking the clients directly is the best way to find out uh, if there is a transportation barrier. And we certainly wouldn't want anybody hitchhiking and, or putting kids in harm's way either of being toted along a busy highway to get to a, an assessment. You also want to ask what the assessment instrument is. Is it a, a, a um, season? Is it a, a tested instrument? Is it culturally appropriate for the population? Um, is it a homegrown instrument? You might want to learn a little bit more about that tool. Next, I'm going to show you a slide that um, really makes a very compelling uh, case for why is it important to, to get to treatment quickly. And this shows the difference in seven days or less. If you, so if you get assessed within a seven-day period or less, your, your chances of completing treatment are around 55%. If it takes 30 days or more to get um, connected to or to get an assessment um, or to, I'm sorry to get to treatment then it takes uh, a big hit on your success rate and you go down to about a 43 or 4 percent success rate so time to treatment and again the assessment is the step in between um, can make a real difference in whether we're setting these these parents up for their most reasonable opportunity to benefit from the treatment that they're trying to get uh, and if it, you may want to even try as a tip uh, checking your own caseload, just grabbing a handful of cases and looking to see how long it took to get to treatment. Um, you might even look at um, unsuccessful cases and see did the unsuccessful cases by 
chance happen to take longer to get to treatment than your successful cases. And so you might be able to begin making the case for why this process needs to be sped up if you happen to be in an area or jurisdiction that has delays. So here's another uh, principle of effective treatment, a NIDA principle, and it's that effective treatment attends to the multiple needs of the individual. Um, and I think our explosion slide, and, and Judge Pock will talk more about that, um, for treatment to really be effective, it has to address all of these other issues. And it doesn't mean that it has to do it all by itself in the treatment center, but, it, but through collaboration with other systems, um, these issues have to be addressed. You know, it, it doesn't do any good to help a parent, um, you know, get recovery under their belt if they're living in a drug-infested, unsafe environment. It doesn't do any good to go through treatment if they don't have a way to support themselves and their family um, when you're trying to maybe keep the kids in the home or return the kids home. And so drug use has, has kind of hijacked their whole life, usually at this point, and all areas will need attention. Okay, the next slide, um, it, it's important to remember that effective treatment um, needs to also address trauma. Um, and we have to assume, for the most part, that the client population with whom you're working is, uh, is affected. We have to just kind of say it's um, um, an uh, automatic um, assumption. It's, you know, um, universally accepted that they will have had trauma. And there are some statistics here you can look at that look at how prevalent this is, particularly among women. Um, and that if you do not have trauma addressed in treatment, either directly or indirectly, while they're there um, on their time frame, then it could very likely trip that case up. Um, and we see that time and time again, where somebody allegedly gets through treatment, they get through it, com they complete, they get their certificate, everybody's thrilled, and then, then they relapse very shortly thereafter. And everyone's scratching their heads and don't realize that often the very emotional wound that under, was underlying their use um, was never addressed. And so that's, uh, again, that's not reasonable, I would, I would say. It would not be reasonable to not address the number one contributing factor for many families. We have examples here um, of another principle, and that is a NIDA principle, that treatment should be evidence-based. Here are some examples of the kinds of um, evidence-based treatment, uh, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational incentives and contingency management. There's different medications that can help um, treatment stay successful, um, and those are uh, here on your slide. Um, and it's important to know that many of the evidence-based um, programs are available at no charge. And so there's really no excuse for treatment not being evidence-based, not in this day and age, and not with the amount of resources that are available, particularly through um, some of the federal agencies like SAMHSA and OJJDP that have, ex that have these kinds of models um, downloadable, or at least some of these. The next slide will show the examples of um, some evidence-based programs for trauma survivors. So these may be ones that are incorporated in a larger treatment effort. So you, you may have other kinds of treatment going on, and then you may have, for example, a seeking safety group for um, trauma survivors. So maybe they attend that once a week in addition to the other kinds of, of um, uh, treatment services that they're getting. So these are not uh, mutually exclusive. You, you can get these treatment, uh, um, uh, one of these or more treatment for trauma in conjunction with the other uh, evidence-based treatment um, that I referenced on the prior slide. Um, and then also, while it's a whole other webinar uh, on being trauma-informed, um, you know, hopefully the treatment providers, in addition to providing trauma-specific treatments, are offering a trauma-informed environment in which all of these uh, services are delivered. So we're down to the last few slides here. This next one I'd like to show uh, is just a quick uh, reminder of what happens if you do not address violence, in this case domestic violence, um, that is occurring in an individual who is seeking treatment. So if, if they if they don't have current domestic violence, either because it's been addressed or it wasn't an issue to begin with, there's about a 77% completion rate based on this particular study, and, and there's others that have demonstrated similar outcomes. Where if you have current domestic violence, that, that being that it is not addressed in treatment, then your success rate falls um, to a little bit more than half of what it could have been. Um, so again, coming back to this whole concept of reasonable efforts, 
Um, you know, if, if it's not addressing ongoing domestic violence, if the treatment's not addressing trauma, if it's not evidence-based, if it's not timely, uh, and so forth, um, then I would question whether it was even reasonable to expect that the, that the um, parent could have um, been successful. Next. So this slide references um, some research that found that women who participate in programs that have high levels of family and children's services and employment, education, and such are twice as likely to reunify with their children as those who participated in programs that had low-level services. Uh, and high reunification rates for families involved in the child welfare system um, you know, is, is such a, a critical measure for all of us, for those families as well as for our programs. So, you know, uh, and, and you look at with all the states having, you know, um, budgets that are out of control, and you look at how much money we're spending in out-of-home care, there's no reason why we can't have um, more and more family-focused treatment. And that could also be a whole other webinar, but there's, there's lots of strategies that do not have to cost more money that do look at the family as a whole, that do look at getting some of these other services from collaborating um, partners in the community that can make such a difference um, in these families. And so to not uh, at least make every effort to get that in place for these families, again, would challenge whether or not um, reasonableness was met for these families. So one of the last principles we're going to cover today is remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time, uh, and that, um, as I said earlier, you know, we scratch our heads sometimes when we say, well, how come they didn't get well faster, but we fail to realize that they may have had a problem brewing for decades, and that's a lot of behavior to unlearn and to relearn and, and lots of brain healing that has to happen and lots of other things. So making sure that they're in uh, for a length of time. Um, the research is pretty clear that three months in treatment is, is pretty much the least amount of treatment that you would expect for someone to have the best uh, outcomes, but longer durations are preferred. Um, recovery from drug addiction is a long-term process. It frequently requires multiple episodes of treatment, just like with anything else. I mean, you think about trying to quit cigarettes use, trying to go on a diet, trying to get diabetes under control, and other kinds of, of medical conditions. Um, it is very rare that anything gets fixed the first time out. It usually requires multiple episodes. And, um, but what you'll typically see is that with each subsequent episode, the person starts at a much healthier position so that um, they're able to get back on track much more quickly, uh, typically, um, when this happens. Um, and so if individuals leave treatment prematurely, that um, everything should be done to try to re-engage them back in um, so that they don't lose ground uh, any more than they have to. Um, this next slide shows a very um, nice illustration that just makes a point I made a minute ago, that, that relapse is very common uh, with all illnesses, and drug addiction is no different. And you can see how drug addiction compares to these other kinds of, of chronic conditions. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there are things that we know to look for that would let us know that someone might be on the road to relapse. Um, and that, again, could be a whole other webinar, but just the Reader's Digest Cliff Notes version would be things like missed appointments, um, also missing AA and NA meetings, um, not being on track with their treatment plan, not following through with some of the things that they agreed to fall through with, follow through on, and um, those kinds of uh, examples. So um, re treatment retention and completion. Um, is something that we're all held accountable for, and um, it's so important to get clients to stay and complete treatment because it is one of the strongest predictors of reunification with children of substance abusing parents. So uh, another good reason why we want to make sure treatment is reasonable and that uh, folks stick with it and complete. Um, and that when at all possible, substance abuse treatment services include children in treatment. Um, and that can lead to improved outcomes for the parent uh, and also improved outcomes for the child. And I don't mean just in residential treatment. This can even be done in outpatient services um, where you know, every person is included on that primary client's treatment plan to look at you know, what are their needs and are their needs getting met and looping them in as much as possible. Um, also, partners. An untreated partner is one of the major 
uh, ingredients for relapse for, for the other individual. So um, not treating a partner, uh, whether you do it directly or indirectly, uh, could come back and haunt you uh, as well as that, that uh, parent. And last but not least, um, just a reminder that addiction is a treatable disease. Um, you know, thankfully, we've made major inroads over the years um, in the science of addiction, and we've had lots of advances in drug abuse treatment um, that help individuals stop using drugs and resume their productive lives. It doesn't need to be a life sentence, um, but like other chronic diseases, uh, it can be managed successfully, and treatment enables people to counteract the powerful hold that addiction had on them and the disruptive effects on their brain and their behavior. Uh, and helps them regain uh, control of their lives. So, um, you know, it, you play an important role in this, you know, hoping that, every, that you're doing everything you can um, to, to provide true, reasonable clinical efforts uh, for these parents and their, their family members. So next we'd like to hear from Honorable Nicolette Pock. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I'm Nicolette Pock, uh, and what I want to do in this my presentation is take some of the broad concept, concepts from Pam Baston's presentation and look at how to use them to improve our family drug court practice. The concepts I want to focus on is time to treatment, the shorter time, the better the result, the impact of drugs on the brain, that parents who have just decided to stop using drugs don't function and interact the way we want them to, and Pam's slide that so beautifully illustrates all the explosions in parents' lives that they somehow need to manage while we're expecting them to conform to our rules. And finally, the, the importance of effective treatment. If family drug court is serious about improving outcomes for parents, assuring that we are, assuring that we are sending them to evidence-based treatment seems to be, to me, a basic obligation. And I, and I want to look at how these concepts apply when the judge decides whether reasonable efforts have been made or not made in each individual case under the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Of course, uh, family drug court is all about accountability. We hold parents accountable for their own recovery. Team members are held accountable for providing recovery support. But all of this is an exercise in futility if we don't have effective treatment. Family drug court has a legitimate interest in assuring that treatment meets the needs of our participants. Um, the judge can take a lead. The judge is in a unique position to raise questions about whether or not treatment is effective. On the individual case level, by bringing the team members together at staffing and court reviews. And on the systems level, by bringing together the policymakers to discuss service needs, service gaps in the community, and the quality of services in the community. If the judge invites the leader of family drug court partner agencies, they will come. The judge has the opportunity and the responsibility to hold everyone accountable when she makes reasonable efforts findings throughout the case. The law views this as holding child welfare services accountable, but really it's the entire system and community that are part of reasonable efforts. And for the family drug court population, reasonable efforts is an empty promise uh, if treatment is not evidence-based. If our operations, policies, and procedures are not insisting on evidence-based treatment, our efforts may be counterproductive. Pam told us that people who entered treatment in seven days had significantly better outcomes than people who entered after 30 days. That's why reasonable efforts in family drug court should include timely, uh, timely entry, entry into treatment court in the first place, and then timely and facilitated uh, access to assessments and timely and facilitated access to appropriate uh, treatment. For me, reasonable efforts also includes practical recovery support. I used to call this the no excuses plan when I started my drug court, but now I've come to see that it's really the case manager acting as the barrier buster. Pam told us that brain functioning, uh, about brain functioning during uh, addiction and recovery, and we need to act accordingly. Take the example of a parent in my court who needed a birth certificate to get to treatment, to get into treatment. The mother who had just agreed to enter drug court, but she was not likely to succeed when it meant she had to travel from my county out on the east end of Long Island to the Bureau of Vital Statistics in Brooklyn without any assistance. She had all those other impacting issues you saw in the explosion slide, 
and she hadn't stopped using drugs yet. Her brain was affected by drugs. Imagine her taking the bus to the train to the subway, finding the right building, and paying for all of it on her own. It was a recipe for disaster. Concrete support at the right time is part of reasonable efforts. So team members must acquire skills through training and collaborative relationships so they know when to offer concrete assistance and when a parent should be able to navigate on her own. And protocols for linking parents to services should include what we call the warm handoff. Not just telling the parent where to go and sending over a referral form, but acting as the go-between until the parent is actually engaged in services. And in return, the service provider must give timely reports to family drug court so the parent's progress is known to the team. And that progress must be tracked so the parents in the team know where things stand. All of this is part of appropriate efforts. One of the levers for ensuring effective treatment is the court process. If a judge made a finding that reasonable efforts were not made because of inadequate treatment options, that would get some attention. The judge is unlikely to address the issue if no one raises it. And it's in everyone's best interest to have the right treatment available. If treatment issues are raised early in the family drug court process, then there is hope of correcting the problem before it's too late. When a parent is struggling, it's worth finding out why. Is it one of the many explosions in her life? Or is it a clinical issue? Staffing and case review in court can uh, where treatment reports on treatment progress, case managers report on a phase progress in the family drug court, child welfare reports on progress on the case plan, this is the point at which attorneys can raise issues about whether or not treatment is effective. And at that point, the judge can, reorder, can order a clinical reassessment where the experts will weigh in. Everyone benefits if you do this early and if you avoid getting to the point where the judge is making a finding that reasonable efforts were not made at the permanency hearing, or worse, at the, tr at the trial for termination of parental rights. The family drug court process can enhance treatment, engagement, retention, and completion. Try what we call a virtual walkthrough of your process to see if your process is reasonable. This, is a, uh, this wa virtual walkthrough is a step-by-step -step look using case records at what a parent is expected to do from the time the case is filed until the parent enters treatment and the family drug court. In one court I worked with, the, it was well more than a month before the parent entered treatment and family drug court. Their process was complex, and some of the tasks could surely have waited until after the parent was in treatment. They were creating barriers, not removing them. And you may even be able to engage some parents in family drug court treatment before adjudication if there are agreements in place about how information that's learned at the assessment can be used uh, or not used um, to make them feel more free to say, yes, go ahead, I'll, I'll do an assessment. And you can use PAM's information to the design your sanctions and incentives and help you target the most important behaviors relative to recovery. As to drug tests, they don't have to be a gotcha moment. They can be used to motivate the parent not to use. When they're, ha when they're with their friends and the, somebody's passing around the drugs or wants to tempt them into it, they can say, I can't do it. I got a drug test coming. So it's, it doesn't have to be such a negative um, experience. And if we have phase systems that have concrete and measurable benchmarks, Marks, they let the parents know how they are doing. The parents can monitor themselves. Um, to avoid some of the pitfalls, you might want to look at your assessment process. Are parents getting into the right level of care at the beginning? Another thing you might look at is, are you offering concrete assistance, taking into account the information on brain functioning, and avoiding the trap of saying, well, if she really loved her children, or if she were really motivated, she would accomplish these tasks on her own. Are you assuring that appropriate information is being communicated? Just enough to measure recovery, but without revealing personal details that have no bearing on progress and really can feel like an invasion of privacy? Are parents clear on what's expected of them? Are your benchmarks concrete and measurable 
or are they vague statements about making sufficient progress, whatever that is? Um, at the system and policy level, uh, take a look at whether or not we have protocols in place to ensure effective treatment. You remember all of those explosions. Do we have all the partners at the table who can help address these? Family Drug Court and many public and private uh, agencies in the community already have mutual clients with the Family Drug Court. And their leadership or their staff can surely see the benefit of collaborating with the drug court. Get them to the table. And in order to sustain our family drug courts, can we convince the powers that be that it's worth it? Can we report what we have actually accomplished? Not just how many units of service have been delivered, but what's actually been accomplished. The future of family drug court depends on being able to demonstrate that mutually agreed on, on outcomes have been accomplished in individual cases, in system performance, and in cost savings over the short and long run. The judge and the coordinator each have a role, along with the partner agencies, in setting expectations for effective treatment. The government entities that oversee treatment certification and contracts may be at the county, regional, or state level. But if you keep data and share your outcome with them, you can help them encourage evidence-based practice. Establish linkage agreements with providers so that everyone knows exactly what's expected when the family drug court refers a parent to their program. The judge can engage, engage the directors of treatment programs in this discussion by setting up a meeting or lunch to explain what the family drug court is looking for. The coordinator and partner agency managers can establish specific expectations. The coordinator, along with treatment and child welfare, can agree on what data needs to be tracked. Um, then use data to, to review the family drug court uh, is program. Monitor treatment outcomes by provider. Keep track of the data and be able to report to the powers that be no matter who purchases the services. The contracts with the provider to be amended to include language that requires evidence-based practices. Just a word of caution. Judges can participate in setting out expectations and contract language for treatment. But it may be inappropriate for a judge to participate in anything that looks like rating a, a treatment provider as excellent, adequate, or unacceptable. This is because the provider may individual cases before the same judge, even if the provider will no longer be referred family drug court cases. The judge has to avoid the, the appearance of having a bias for or against a particular provider. The coordinator and case managers can take it upon themselves to go out and visit treatment providers from time to time, use what you learn there, and ask questions about their program practices. Ask how their program fits with the NIDA principles and what model of treatment is being used. And consider this. While funds are always tight, it may be money and time well spent to financially support training for providers, especially where treatment is limited to one or two providers. The point of having a collaborative team to run the family drug court is to be mutually supportive of each other rather than pointing fingers. And giving that kind of support to treatment may give them the opportunity to offer what's really needed. So just to recap, take a look at the main concept. Time to treatment is important. The shorter, the better. The impact of drugs on the brain. The parents who have just decided to stop using drugs don't function and interact even with their children the way we want them to. And all those explosions in parents' lives that somehow need to be managed while we're expecting them to conform to the family drug court rules. And finally, of course, the importance of effective treatment. If family drug court is serious about improving outcomes for parents and the lives of children, assuring that we are sending them to evidence-based treatment is a basic obligation of family drug courts. Take a look and see how your policies and procedures take these concepts into account. Now I think I turn it back to Teresa. We're going to move on to resources. Um, before we do that, I'd like to take a moment to um, answer some questions. Um, I, and I won't be answering all of them. We've got um, both Pam Baston and Judge Nicolette Pock also to help answer. But we've had two great questions from the audience. One question is, given that it takes a long time 
for someone to overcome their addiction, why do we front load all of the requirements in the initial phase of drug court rather than slowly increase the requirements over time? I'm going to ask Pam if she'd like to take um, a stab at that question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's an excellent question and one that I've asked myself uh, many times. And I, I believe that when many of those standards were developed years ago, it predated our increasing understanding of the complexity um, of addiction and its impact on the brain. And I think that part of the other challenge is um, given the ASPA time clock and the you know compressed time frames that surround these cases, you know there's this rush to make sure that that the client has the advantage of every possible um, opportunity to demonstrate that they're being that they're successful. And I think that we risk um, having the the opposite effect by by loading too much. And so. You know, I, I would suggest that, um, that that get looked at over time, and particularly if there's a way uh, to um, stretch out the achievement time so that even if you're front-loading um, things like supports, which, which are needed, um, that we, when we have an opportunity to stretch out accomplishment of certain um, activities or certain requirements that we've placed on uh, the client that we that we do that so you know more front loading of supports but more reasonable time um, for um, for the clients to be able to um, you know achieve some of these requirements that we, we place on them and, and I agree with you and um, I also happen to know that the particular uh, poll the person who asked the question he's brilliant and um, probably have some very good suggestions of how um, we could accomplish that, but, but I do agree that it's a concern. Well, and Pam, thank you for that. Um, I think the other thing that we could add to that um, is having everyone that forms the Family Drug Court team, all of those partners, you know, take a look at all of our individual agency requirements. So, you know, coming at you know, coming to the table as a treatment provider, which is where, where I had come from in the past, I mean, you know, we, we have a treatment plan. And so we, um, you know, it, this was probably 15 years ago, but there was really little thought about, gosh, um, the goals that we're helping our client come up with around treatment and the things that we're expecting them to do, how does that impact their ability to do all the things that are on their case plan or all the things that the court is requiring outside of that. So I think um, that would be the one add I would have to what Pam said in that we need to really look at, okay, who's asking them to do what? Sort of look at a master plan and is this reasonable given the situation for this client and let's, let's you know, take a look at that, all of those requirements and as Pam said, let's try to stretch them out so that they have more meaning than just checking off a box and saying, I accomplished that. So thank you for the person that asked that question. I've got one more question, um, and that is, um, what are NOMS that, and I'm just going to stop there and say that NOMS, it's an acronym, N-O-M-S, are the national outcome measures um, set for by the federal government um, for publicly funded treatment programs. So the question was, what are NOMS? What is the role of drug court when it comes to treatment programs meeting their NOMS? Um, I'll take a quick stab at that, and then I want to ask both Pam and, and Judge Pock if they have anything to add. But when you're looking at national outcome measures and if a treatment provider is meeting those, um, you know, those are things like, you know, are, are the participants staying in treatment? You know, are they becoming employed? Are they, um, you know, not, not reoffending? Um, some of those different things that we look at, um, sort of like community indicators that we as treatment programs would report back to the federal government to say, hey, we're using your fund, the funding that you're giving us um, effectively. So I think, as a former treatment provider, how family drug courts impact NOMS is that I think that when treatment providers become a part of a family drug court, um, I think they do that because they want to do better. Um, they want to step up um, in terms of 
um, having a more collaborative practice. They want to be a trusted, respected part of a team. And um, they, they want, in a lot of cases, um, the, I guess the plus that comes along with family drug court clients, which is you've got this entire team all working towards the same goal um, with this client. And so there's, um, there's some of the coercion that happens because um, you know, their child and the relationship with their child, um, whether or not they're able to reunite with their child, um, may be um, an issue, but it, it tends to help the individual, um, in a lot of cases, um, really meet their treatment plan, do better in treatment, or at least go through the motions until, until that point in time that their brain starts to function normally again and they um, are able to really engage in um, their own recovery. And so I think from my perspective as a former treatment provider, I think that's how family drug courts can impact the noms. It really helps treatment programs um, take the next step in terms of collaborative practice. So Pam, I'd just like to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add there. Uh, no, just that um, while the treatment provider has to report on NOMS, they're gained from every single client. So there's forms that have to be filled out um, that speak to, you know, how many people came in without a job, left with a job, how many people came with um, you know, uh, how many have used drugs in the last 30 days. And, and so whatever the, the NOMs are that they're reporting on are done individually. So every client counts. Every, every time you can help, um, you know, get some good progress going, uh, that will make a difference for that provider that has to, to aggregate those and send them in. All right, we have another question. We've got a few minutes, so we want to take as many of these as possible. And Pam, I think this is for you, but Judge Pock, I'd like to hear from you on this as well after Pam. As you've emphasized, recovery takes time. How do family drug courts deal with the fact that in many communities, the public funding for treatment does not support the time needed to assist people moving into recovery? You know, and that is a very difficult question. and. Um, the only thing I can say to that is that uh, this is where um, having um, meetings with the treatment providers and the other policy makers is critical because often the ones that are coming up with the rules about how much money you get to, to treat an addiction or how much time or how many, how many episodes of care uh, might be approved in the case of managed care for a particular client oftentimes the individuals that are making those policies are either making them based on old information from years ago before you know we know what we know now about um, how important length of time and dosage is how important that is and then also um, they may um, so they may need to be educated and there sometimes needs to be some pressure brought to bear about um, you know, if we continue down that road of insufficiency in terms of time or dosage, that the very outcomes that they're wanting to get are not going to happen. And, um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to display this. Um, in some of the places we've worked, we've literally um, gathered data around how much time, and I'm going to use an example now of, um, let's say, a, a, a family that has kids in temporary custody. Um, of the state and say, you know, how much money does it cost every day that those kids are out in out-of-home care? And, um, you know, what, uh, what are the costs of not reunifying in a more timely fashion? And so looking at what, what the costs are when, you, when it's not done correctly and trying to make, you know, compelling arguments to the policymakers around um, you know, you may get what you pay for. If you're buying insufficiency, then you may get insufficient outcomes, and you know the long-term um, cost of that will cost more than if you had uh, provided the proper uh, dosage of treatment and for the proper duration. Um, also, um, luckily, there are examples all over this country of very affordable treatment models that are very innovative. Um, some of the best actually in the state of Georgia where they seem to have mastered the learning curve on how to utilize standard apartment complexes 
where they move willing families into the apartments, which many of them need safe housing anyway, and they co-locate child welfare staff and clinical staff um, in the same apartment complex, and uh, clients pay their rent just as they would have somewhere else, even if it means it's partially subsidized. Uh, but the clinical support, instead of being down the street or somewhere at an outpatient location, they, they bring those services to bear at the facility. Sometimes they transport them down the street to the facility. It's different types of models. But the point is that they can simulate the intensity and duration of a residential treatment program for the cost of an outpatient program. And bringing in all the resources, um, you know, they'll get literacy workers to come in and provide literacy assistance. They'll bring in volunteer teachers. They'll bring in domestic violence staff to come in and do groups around, um, you know, um, how to, um, to, to be safe and how to negotiate uh, you know the your needs in a in a partnership that may be violent, and how or how to extract yourself from such a situation, and then um, have all kinds of developmentally appropriate services for the kids, and all of these resources being brought in from the community and and delivered in a model that um, that's very cost effective, and, and that's just one example, but there are lots of other ways to simulate. Um, the intensity and, and also potentially through ongoing follow follow up and continuing care um, to help keep that family connected to the services and supports that they need after treatment is uh, is over. Um, it's also why NA and AA uh, are so important and um, how I'm still amazed I've been now in every state but two doing reviews of various programs and um, I think pretty much in almost every state I've been in, I've encountered programs where when I ask, you know, how is AA and NA going and what do you do to, to make those connections, I'll be told something like, you know, oh, I have the brochure that shows where the groups are here somewhere and they'll spend 15 minutes trying to find it. And so I know, you know, it's probably not likely that that AA and NA is promoted as much as it should, but we know that it boosts treatment outcome and we know that that, that network is there long after we're gone. So, um, you know, connecting to other peer support, other pro-social uh, systems in a community, um, working with, with your, your policymakers to really, you know, bring pub public pressure to, to change uh, if the system is, is not sufficient. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, Judge Pock, I don't know if you would have anything to add, um, but I would like to give you the opportunity to do that. Just very briefly, it, that all goes to show you why we have to keep data on things that are important to all of the partners in our programs and share that data to leverage what we need. Thank you so much. Well, I'd like to um, say we're very sorry we can't get to every question that have has um, been posed this morning, but we will put these up and um, respond to them for you. And I, I know that if you submitted a question, um, we've given you some information about, about how we'll make that the, the answers to that um, available. So I'm just going to talk really quickly before we end today about resources and some next steps. Um, I'm going to go pretty quickly through these slides, but just to say that, you know, as we've talked at you today about how to look at effective treatment, we wanted to give you some tools. So this first one, a community scorecard, is an example. Um, it comes from New York State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services, um, but it's one that in that state that you could go to this website and you could look at um, some indicators that have been set by that state for substance abuse treatment programs um, to, to have an understanding of, you know, do they meet certain criteria? And that might be a first step um, for someone in that state. Um, there's a, a huge need for ongoing training. Um, and I'm going to throw some resources at you. But, you know, when we've talked today, we talk about collaborative work, um, understanding, you know, what everyone brings to the table. Um, and, and the best way to do that is to understand not only your own role and responsibility you know, at the table as a family drug court um, team member, but to have an understanding of others. And so I, I know that it's very important, and we hear this over and over, when the team takes the time to do site visits to, let's say, um, the treatment provider, to the residential treatment program. What does it look like? How does it feel? What are the staff, you know, you know where do they sit? Just having that mental picture 
of um, the resources and uh, of the team members that, that come to the meetings every week to understand the context of where they work. So I would say that for every team member. I mean, we go into the court usually for family drug court, so we have an understanding of that context. But does everybody understand what everything else looks like out there in the community? So that is a, a huge thing that um, Judge Poff talked about is doing site visits. You know, also, when you understand the role of your partners, um, it, it helps you better support them um, as they carry out their responsibility in the family drug court. Um, look at these types of things. Are treatment services in your FBC, are they gender specific? You know, are they, do they have services specifically for women, specifically for men? Um, do, they, do they incorporate the needs of the child? Um, not to say if they don't that you get rid of them, but this is where when we talked earlier about how, how can um, a family drug court help a treatment program, I know my treatment program became you know, leaps and bounds um, you know, improvement because we had somebody saying, hey, you know, could you guys do this? Could you guys do this? It really pushed us. And I think that's one place that family drug courts can really help when it comes to um, the treatment services. Um, culturally relevant, um, you know, what does your demographic look like and are we hitting all of those different populations? Um, where are they? You know, are they travel, expected to travel 20 miles between um, the treatment program and where they're getting um, tested? So um, having a, a sense of that is really going to help you look at um, the barriers um, that families are facing. So family-centered, you want to make sure, of course, that this is a family drug court. We're not just there for the parent. We are there for the entire family. So how do we incorporate that? Um, services to children I talked a little bit about. And recovery support and aftercare. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, you know, you would never expect that someone who's been diagnosed with diabetes or cancer or some other chronic disease that they would, um, or any disease, that they would just go to their doctor a couple of times and then stop. Um, you, you go back to them. You go back and say, hey, this is how I'm doing, or how am I doing? I'm getting, getting some refreshers. Um, surrounding themselves with the kind of people that are going to help them make the best decisions. So that's really a responsibility that you want to ask your treatment provider to, to look into. Um, some documents and some um, manuals that can be really helpful. If you go to the website for National Institute on Drug Abuse, they have lots of pamphlets and flyers and things that you can put out for your populate your client population, um, but also really to help you cross-train yourself and others on the team. Sorry, I'm going through these really quickly. We don't want to forget about rural um, areas. It, it can be really tough when we go into rural areas and we're saying, oh, you know, do you have this service and this service and this service? Sometimes the answer is no, no, and no. Um, and so um, in those cases, we, we, we really have to look at and stretch our arms out even further to look for partners that are going to help us um, provide the best services. So there's some resources specifically that have been developed for rural regions. Some of them have to do with funding, but some of them also have to do with just some solutions that other programs have found. So I would encourage you, if you're a rural family drug court, to look at these resources. Um, we have a couple of tools that we, um, some of you may have participated um, with us around, and that is our um, collaborative values inventory and our collaborative capacity instrument, both developed by um, Children and Family Futures. Um, these can really help you look at some of those cross-training issues in your team. Um, and so I would encourage you, if this is something after today that you feel like might be helpful around, hey, we really need some cross-training. We really need to have a better understanding of, of how all of our partners are functioning. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to us and um, request technical assistance around these issues. Um, I'm going to just go through these pretty quick so that we can get you guys back to um, your day on time. We've got some online tutorials that we talk about you know, during most of our webinars. I would encourage you to visit our website at the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. These are free online tutorials with free CEUs, um, and they've been developed specifically for um, child welfare workers, substance abuse treatment professionals, and legal professionals to um, understand 
um, not only their own role, but others' roles on the family drug court team. Um, I'd like to just take the opportunity to um, just show you the slides really quickly on our Learning Academy, and I talked a little bit about that at the beginning. So um, last but not least, our next um, webinar is going to be coming up on Wednesday, October 10th. We'd like you to register for that if you're interested. It's Family Drug Court Models Integrated versus Parallel. And um, this is a very hot topic right now of you know, how family drug courts can structure themselves in a manner that works the best for that community. So we really encourage you to register for this webinar um, and join us in October. Last, please fill out your evaluation for us. Let us know what worked for you, what you'd like to see us do differently. Um, we value your feedback, and we definitely will use it to improve the service that we provide. We want to thank you for joining our webinar today, and um, we look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar. Thank you.